We are going to sing a chorus, My Savior Lives. So let's go ahead and stand and sing, My Savior Lives. you that are on the special music schedule. The new schedules are in your mailbox. So um, if you'll get those from there, if you have any questions about anything, just get with me. Thank you. Fantastic. And welcome to each one. Oh, it is so exciting to see springtime actually happening, even though I don't think it's getting above freezing today, is it? <laughs> so 
at least we didn't have to shovel. So, um, ushers, if you would hand out the Ministry of Friendship books, and as you are doing that, I wonder if we have anyone here for the very first time who would be brave enough to stand and mention your name and where you're from. You don't have to, but we welcome you to if you'd like to. Well, hey, if you are, we are so glad that you are here, and if you will sign the Ministry of Friendship book along with everyone else, that will give us record of your attendance with us today. And uh, once you have signed that, uh, send that book back then the other direction, opened up, and that way you can get better acquainted with those who are seated in your row. Um, also, you will notice after the service this morning in the uh, foyer that there are some uh, things that are posted up there on the... Uh, Easels, um, the uh, kids were able to uh, have $200 that they have brought in for Child Evangelism Fellowship, and you'll see about how they went about doing that. And these were uh, kids from our Sunday school hour, and just so great that they were able to do that. Two meetings after the service, 11.38 a.m., <laughs> of the corner classroom, a literally 30-second nominating committee meeting. And then after that is done, I will be heading to the next meeting, which will be in my Sunday school class for the teens who are going on the summer mission trip and their parents and uh, the adults who are chaperoning for that. That will be probably no more than 10 minutes, but that will be in that room, uh, my Sunday school classroom. Also to mention that tonight at 6 o'clock, we continue our study in the book of Luke, looking at a lesson entitled, Lessons Learned. So hope you can join us for that as well. And the teens will be concluding the series dug down deep tonight. Also, um, next uh, Sunday morning, uh, the teens will be in charge of the morning service. Hope you can uh, join us for that and to encourage them. Next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, uh, new members class for those wishing to be baptized and or become members of Jasper Bible Church. If you are interested in that, either get with me or Larry Keck, and that way we can sort of plan accordingly. One week from tonight, teens, you will be seeing the uh, movie To Save a Life, and that will be uh, down at the other section, and I believe popcorn is going to be available as well, I hear. Also to mention, uh, uh, Dan Helmanak, as he mentioned last week, will be going on a mission trip to Uganda, and you'll see the information in the bulletin if you would like to give toward uh, that um, missionary outreach. I think everything else in the bulletin is pretty much self-explanatory, but the ushers can come up for this morning's offering, and as they are uh, doing so, to share with you some uh, prayer request updates, uh, Carol DeLong had a very, very, very good report, except for one spot uh, that they need to deal with now. She is cancer-free, so some good news on that. John Anger and uh, Don Dunn, both recuperating and getting their strength back there at uh, Provincial House, continue to be praying, if you will, for uh, Judy Rattan. I know she would appreciate your prayers. Um, also, uh, Tony Bell's brother, Nick Bell, uh, April 5th, will be going to uh, Afghanistan. So remember uh, him. He's already been once to Iraq and now Afghanistan. Be praying, if you will, for uh, Ryan Bowden as well, as he is uh, now in uh, training for uh, Navy. And also, uh, continue to be praying, if you will, for... Uh, Sharon Ford, as she recuperates, and Sharon Lakatas, remember uh, Sharon, you in your prayers also. Um, um, Patty Blair's mom, Viola, be praying for her, has, her mom has some significant health-related needs as well. We will have our prayer time, and I believe uh, Judy Sullins has the operatory special for us and can be getting ready for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for each one that's in our service today, for this nice day that uh, you've given to us. And we think of uh, uh, these who are uh, back with us, and uh, uh, Rudy and Joyce, and think that they can be back with us in the safety you gave them. We think of others who will be heading back from Florida the next few weeks. You'll give them safety as well. And also thank you for the good news as far as Carol, that you would continue to strengthen her. And we think, too, of Judy Rutan and John Anger and uh, Don Dunn and uh, Sharon Lakatos, the Sharon Ford, that you would uh, encourage them and meet each and every need there, I pray. Pray that uh, for Alan Morgenthaler, that his eye would uh, heal up quickly after this uh, surgery that he had. And we think, too, of, um, of Ryan uh, Bowden, that you protect and watch over him. And, and we think of uh, uh, Nick Bell, that you'll give him safety as he heads out the uh, next couple of weeks here to Afghanistan. And Lord, I also think of those who have a special need upon their heart that wasn't mentioned just now, but you know all about it. And I just pray that you would give wisdom and guidance and grace and strength to each of them. And 
I ask your blessing now upon this morning's offering, thanking you for the privilege that we have to give back to you. Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Good morning. Song's called Come See Me. I can't tell what's deep inside Earth's very caverns I've only read about their jewels rich and rare I've not explored the depth of any ocean but if you'd like to meet the Savior I've been there when you're ready to of sin and longing to be free to be free when you need a love that's so much deeper than your deepest sin when you're ready to come home
Thank you, Judy, for the offertory special. We are going to sing a hymn, and that hymn number is 175, Standing on the Promises. Hymn number 175, Standing on the Promises. And we have to stand because it says standing, so let's stand, please. This past Friday evening, there were over 50 from our church that were there to watch the movie God's Not Dead. And I know that there are uh, several who went uh, yesterday, probably others who are planning to go see that movie in the next uh, few days. In all honesty, there was a lot of hype about this movie, and usually when you have a movie that has a lot of hype, it doesn't uh, uh, match up to the hype. In this case, it's uh, uh, my thought that it exceeded the hype. Absolutely fantastic, and uh, what a great uh, privilege it is to have a movie like that uh, here in our area. But a, uh, a movie such as this that talks concerning God and the reality of God also reminds us of this truth. If God is real then so is heaven, and so is hell. Because it is God's word that tells us about God, it's the same Bible that tells us concerning hell, which refers to hell much more frequently than it does heaven. The Bible tells us that every single one of us will spend forever in one of two places either heaven or hell. Heaven being far greater than words could ever comprehend, hell being far worse than words could ever describe. The big problem is this. If you ask people, most people think they're on their way to heaven. However, if you ask people on what basis they believe that they'll be going there, 
Usually they mention some kind of work that they've done. That they've been baptized or they take communion or they're a member of a church or they think they've done more good than bad or they're kind to their neighbor or they give money to the poor or whatever list that they have at their works. Isn't that a problem though? Most people think they're on their way to heaven and most people are not trusting in the one person to get them there. Which means that one day there is going to be a very rude awakening for many people who are trusting in their works rather than the work that was done by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. The Bible tells us that there's just one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. It truly is a Jesus-only club. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned, or all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But that 2,000 years ago, the reason why Jesus came to this earth is to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to be the spotless Lamb of God who would die on the cross in our place for our sins. That when he was crucified, all the bad things that we had ever done were heaped upon him. And then he rose from the grave. The one way and only one way that you will ever be able to enter God's holy heaven is through receiving Jesus and his death on the cross as payment for your sin. That's it. No other options. It's not as though there are many roads and they're all leading to heaven. Jesus said of himself, he's the one way. The question is, have you made the most important decision of your life? The question is, who are you trusting to get you to heaven? If you'll bow your heads, please. I know there are several of you who have already made the most important decision of your life. It's a one-time decision. It's not a decision you have to make each week. It is a decision that is one time when you put your faith and trust in Christ and you are officially adopted into his family. There are no magical words that are spoken, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to Pray a prayer with me similar to one that I prayed when I received Jesus as my Savior. It's simply putting in words that we want to receive that free gift of salvation that's being offered to us. Because Romans 10.9 says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you'd like to make that decision this morning. God knows the sincerity of your heart. Right where you're seated right now, you can follow along with me if you'd like to in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I admit that I have sinned and that I need to be saved. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that he came back to life again. So I receive Jesus as my Savior and invite him into my life. Lord, I thank you that there is indeed a God. I thank you that you love us so much that you want us to spend forever with you. And for those who just a moment ago prayed that prayer with me, give them the courage to share that with me after the service this morning so I can rejoice with them. Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise team, if you'll come up again. And lead us this time in hymn number 124, 124, all four verses of Lead Me to Calvary. That will be followed by special music from Allison Hunt before our main message for today. 124, Lead Me to Calvary, 124. Let's stand again as we sing, please.
God came down and gave his life for me. Amen, amen. Through flesh and blood he fought for victory. Thank you, Allison, for the special music this morning. And if you will turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. In the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, page 1109. 1109, if you're using the Bible right in front of you, if you're seated in a pew or if you're seated in a chair, right underneath the chair. Acts chapter 27, and in a few moments we'll be beginning with verse 9, in a message entitled, Weathering a Winter Storm. You have experience with that, don't you? We've sure weathered a storm. We were teased a little bit this week with 50 degrees, and I don't think it's supposed to get it above freezing today, but eventually, even supposed to snow Tuesday, I guess, 
eventually, sorry, I just, I just put someone in shock, but uh, e eventually we are going to go from snowing to mowing. And this is terrible, but I have never been so excited in my life to actually mow grass as I have uh, at this point. But I remember when I was mowing the lawn one summer, when there was a frog that got right in front of my lawnmower in the long grass, and it would not budge. It would not budge, and therefore, being the nice animal lover that I am, I simply gave it a little kick into the mowed grass to protect it. But then when I came back through to mow the next line, wouldn't you know it, that same frog had jumped back in to the long grass once again. And here I am, out of the kindness of my heart, seeing this dog in a this dog, this frog. <laughs> yeah, I'd be mowing a dog, that'd be rough. But um, uh, seeing this uh, frog in position to go to frog heaven. And out of the kindness of my heart, I'm trying to keep this frog from croaking. So once again, I kicked this frog, and I went through that whole process time and time again for the longest stretch, but that frog kept going back into the long grass. And you know, sometimes we can contribute to our own problems. And then we blame God for being mean. If I could try to get into the mind of that frog, certainly the frog was thinking, this is such a mean bully with this loud grass-cutting machine. But the truth is, I was compassionate, and even though there was that kick, trying to protect that frog. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy when it comes to problems. Other times, there are circumstances beyond our control. Either way, there is no way to get through life problem-less or pain-free. And maybe I'm speaking to some this morning who know full well what that's all about. You're going through a health crisis. Or you're going through an emotional crisis. Or a financial crisis a marital crisis, a relationship crisis, a job crisis. And perhaps there's no more practical passage in all of Scripture than Acts 27 when it comes to learn how to deal with a crisis. Now, in Acts 27, you will not see the word crisis anywhere in the chapter. But certainly we see a crisis. Paul is sailing to Rome. And Luke is documenting his travels. They're prisoners on their way to Rome. And the problems begin with verse 9. Notice what it says. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now... It was after the fast. In other words, it's past the middle of October, getting into winter. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives as well. Let's stop right there for a moment. We see the cause of a crisis. And sometimes, just like my backyard frog, we can be the ones who contribute to the crisis that we find ourselves in. In this case, it was the case of the Roman centurion soldier who was escorting Paul to Rome, and he had to make the choice of whether or not to sail to Rome. He had the decision, just as you and I have the decision, 
of whose voice he was going to listen to. Now, Paul said in verse 10, don't sail. Maybe the centurion knew who Paul was. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he knew that God was speaking through Paul. Maybe he didn't. Either way, the centurion does not take Paul's advice. Notice verse 11. But the centurion, instead of listening to, for, to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. So here we see the cause of the crisis, which at times can be a cause of crisis in our lives, is that of listening to the wrong voice. What are the wrong voices, and who are the wrong voices that the centurion was listening to? Well, notice, first of all, that the centurion listened to the voice of experts. In this case, the experts would be the ship's pilot and owner. Did you know that today there's an expert in everything? It is amazing. You will turn on the TV and a news show, and you see all these talking heads, and underneath them it will say so-and-so, expert in such-and-such. Amazing how many experts that we have, and yet all the experts have a different idea of what we should do. And we look at this, and we need to realize that it's one thing to get advice from other men, other women. The problem is when we begin to follow whatever they are going to say and listen to their voice of whatever they say, they cease to be our counselors and they become our spiritual guides. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, who is the real expert of how to get through a crisis? Is it someone who's 50 or 60 years old who can't even control their own dandruff? Or is it an eternal God who knows the past, the present, and the future? So the first thing is the centurion listens to the voice of experts. Secondly, the centurion listened to the voice of the majority. Notice verse 12. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. There was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. Now here's my question. Is the majority always right? You know the answer to that. What would have happened in the Bible if the majority had always ruled? Well, the, the Israelites would never have left Egypt. David would never have fought Goliath. Elijah would never have defeated the prophets of Baal. Daniel would never have been allowed to pray. Nehemiah never would have built those walls in Jerusalem. Joseph would never have married a pregnant girl named Mary. And the disciples never would have allowed Jesus to go to the cross. The truth is, in a sin-saturated society, not only is the majority not always right, but the majority can often be wrong. And we have the ongoing challenge to discern the voice of of God from other voices. You see, it's not easy to hear God's voice when your friends are listening to the voice of compromise. It's not easy to hear God's voice on honesty when others around you are getting ahead by cheating the system. It's not easy to hear God's voice on forgiveness when all others around you are telling you to seek revenge. And the majority in a world of sin will often be wrong. Also, the centurion 
Listen to the voice of circumstance. Notice verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Contrary to the old song, the answer, my friend, was not blowing in the wind. We can never make a decision based on the winds of circumstance because we really can't interpret what God is up to. We can't base a decision that we make on feelings. i got to be honest with you. There are days that I feel so close to God, it's though I could reach out and touch Him. And there are other days that I feel a million miles away from God and that He's not there. Both days, He is equally close. There are days that I feel saved. There are days that I don't feel saved. Because I've put my faith and trust in Jesus, on both days I'm equally saved. And so it is, we can't trust feelings. They come and go. The winds of circumstance. We can't trust that. Because we just don't know what it's going to be, and there are so many voices out there trying to tell us something different. In fact, there was this one explorer who was in the Amazon jungle. All of a sudden, he found himself surrounded by cannibals. And he mumbled to himself, I'm doomed. And suddenly, he heard a voice. And the voice said, No, my son. You are not doomed. See that rock over there? Pick up that rock and bash the head of the chief standing in front of you. You heard the voice. So the explorer quickly picked up the rock, bashed the head of the chief, saw the chief laying down in his lifeless body, and then looked around at all the silent cannibals glaring at him. And then the voice said again to him, Okay, now you're doomed. <laughs> we have to be careful to know where the voice is coming from and whose voice it is. And the question that we must ask ourselves is whose voice are we listening to? And because they listened to the wrong voice, the crisis came. Notice in verse 14, it says, Before very long a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. I've learned that this winter, any time you have a winter storm that actually has a name, look out. Here there was a winter storm called the Northeaster, and they were in trouble. The causes of a crisis. But what are the consequences of a crisis. What do we tend to do when we find ourselves in a crisis situation? First of all, during a trial, we tend to drift. Notice verse 15 as it continues. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along as we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda. We were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it abroad, uh, the, they uh, passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. Often, when we find ourselves in a crisis, we tend to drift away and are driven along. It's easy to get weak. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get tired. It's easy to be driven along by everybody else's opinion. And we consult everyone, often but God, who would rather that we anchor firmly in Christ. 
The question is this. Not have you gone through a crisis, because if you aren't now, you will. But are you growing closer to Christ as you go through it? Or are you drifting, drifting from him? You see, a crisis will either make us bitter or better, depending on whether or not we'll trust Christ through it. So, we tend to drift. But also we tend to discard. Notice verse 18 as it continues. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. You know, sometimes it's good to get rid of cargo, the trash that's in our lives. But we need to make sure what it is that we are discarding. We need to make sure that we get rid of the garbage, but not something that's valuable, such as our faith. In the 1940s, some French workers who were in the basement of a Paris museum were sorting through a bunch of things that had been accumulated by Napoleon that he had brought back from Egypt. And they happened to notice a burial case. And they thought, you know, this would be a wonderful case to put all the different Egyptian artifacts within. But there was something in there. So without consulting the overseers of the museum, they went ahead and they dumped what was in there into the sewer. And then they began to use this case to put their odds and ends and artifacts. Only later did they realize that they had disposed of the remains of their most famous Egyptian queen, Cleopatra. We have to be careful what we discard when we're going through the storms of life. The trash, the things that easily beset us, certainly. But not our faith. What happens is we tend to get worrisome. We tend to get hysterical. Not knowing what's going to happen, rather than to listen to God's voice. And as a result, we discard. Also in a crisis, we tend to despair. Notice verse 20, it says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You ever been there? Many dark days in a row? When all hope seems gone? Is God able to help us through such times? Well, God is the one who turned the Red Sea into a sidewalk. God is the one that took a boy's happy meal and fed over 5,000 men. God is the one who had a baby born in a barn in a small village of a forgotten land, and he was the hope of the world. God was the one who made the symbol of a cruel crucifixion and turned the cross into the greatest hope for mankind. And if God can do that, then he can help us conquer our crisis. So the question becomes, how do we conquer our crisis? A couple of things. First of all, we conquer a crisis by remembering what we know. What do we know? First, we know that we have God's presence for God's child. Notice verse 21 as it continues. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Isn't it always nice to say, I told you so? It says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God 
whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me. Stood beside me. Reminds us of the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Even when times in our lives when God seems so far away, remember he's just as equally close at that moment. Paul knew God's presence. He also knew God's purpose. Verse 24, the angel said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Nothing can keep God's purpose from taking place within the life of God's obedient child. A crisis is simply a speed bump, a curve in the road. There was the only survivor of a shipwreck who was washed up to an uninhabited island. And there he prayed for God to somehow rescue him. Some days went by without being rescued. So he managed to build a hut out of some driftwood to protect him from the elements. Well, one day when he was hunting for food, he came back and he saw his hut on fire. Smoke rolling to the sky. The worst possible thing had happened. He had built a fire and the wind had pushed that fire into his hut. And in anger, he cried out to heaven. He said, God, how could you do this to me? The next morning, he woke up to the sound of a ship to rescue him. And he said, how did you know I was here? I said, well, it was easy. We saw your smoke signal. And sometimes the things that we see as a crisis, God as only God can, will use that. To accomplish what he has in mind. God has never been asleep at the wheel. He is batting a thousand. Do you possibly think you in your particular situation at this moment will be the first time he's ever lost it up? The truth is we can depend on him. Paul not only trusted in God's presence and God's purpose, but also God's promise. Notice verse 25. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Either that statement is true or God is a big liar. The question is, can we trust him? So we conquer a crisis by remembering what we know. But we also conquer a crisis by remembering what to do. First of all, what do we do when we're in a crisis? First of all, we drop anchor. Notice verse 27. On the 14th night, we were all uh, still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that we were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we should be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern. The truth is this. When you're in a crisis, you're going to anchor somewhere. Either you will anchor in something very temporary, and something that's not of God, or you will anchor in the promises of God. So drop anchor, and then also drop to your knees and pray. Notice verse 29 as it continues. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Worry and prayer are opposites. They are polar opposites. You can't, not, you can't do both at the same time. Either you are worrying and fretting as far as getting through it, or you are praying and you are trusting in God to help you through it. By the way, later that summer, guess who I came across? Mr. Frog. 
You say, well, how did you know it was the same frog? Well, obviously, it was green and hopping. <laughs> Something else I noticed about this frog, it had learned its lesson. It didn't get near the mower. May it be that we will learn our lesson. And the lesson is this. In this life, we will have problems. In this life, we will have trials. In this life, we will have crisis and make it plural, crises. We will have them. But we have a God who has conquered the grave, who through the shed blood of Christ has given us victory over sin, who has given us eternal life, and will help us every step of the way. We need to drop anchor and drop to our knees. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have learned how to get through a winter storm, Lord, for some, even though the snow is melting, they're going through a storm right now. And you know all about it. They feel forsaken. They're scared. They don't know what's ahead. Lord, give them the grace to drop anchor in you and drop to their knees in prayer and to see firsthand how you can help them every step of the way and that through the same power that rose up Christ from the grave and the same power that through the blood of Christ has saved us is the same power, that, the power of God that we can trust in as we go through the trials of life. Convict us and challenge us with this truth. Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise team, if you'll come up and lead us. The closing chorus. It's that new chorus that you heard at the very beginning of the service this morning. O crimson flow. As always, the invitation is open. Perhaps you've put your faith and trust in Jesus. But now the one that you are trusting for eternal life you need to trust for the trial that you're going through. You can trust him. You can depend on him. The same one whose power raised him from the grave and through his blood can save us from our sins is the same one who will help you through your trial. Let's stand. The invitation is open as we sing. O crimson flow.
He will help you through whatever trial that you're going through. Drop anchor and drop to your knees. And the one who has been faithful every other time will be faithful this time as well. So glad to see each one of you and hope you felt welcome this morning. If I haven't had the opportunity to say hello, would love to do so in the foyer. Reminder about it, two meetings, a very brief 30-second nominating committee meeting in the corner room. And for those teens and the parents and the adults going with them in the, uh, my Sunday school class, will be that meeting after the service as well. Six o'clock tonight. Hope you can join us as we continue our study in the New Testament book of Luke. If you'll remain standing for closing prayer, and Rick, if you close the service in prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word this morning. Thank you for what we've learned from Paul, that we need to trust in you and look to you and, and pray when, when things are not going well, in any crisis or any situations that we may be going through, that, Lord, that we can trust in you and know that you'll pull us through whatever that situation may be. Thank you for each and every one that's here this morning, and I just pray your blessings to be upon us as we leave here. Thank you for loving us and dying for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are dismissed.